Hello, everyone. Um, so today, uh, I will be talking about a completely different topic, um, modeling dust continuum emission, and talking about a completely different code. So I will be talking about three different codes in three days. So if you didn't have a chance to do RADMC yesterday, that's already behind us. We're moving on today. Um, just to clarify, uh, RADMC, which I talked about yesterday, does actually do um, dust continuum. Okay, so you can actually use that code to do that. But for the purpose of variety, uh, today I'm going to switch and talk about a different uh, dedicated <coughs> Monte Carlo radio transfer code. Um, so here's a quick image of the kind of stuff that this code can do. This is uh, post-processing one of my numerical simulations, a uh, turbulent cloud with forming stars, and producing a synthetic uh, Herschel PAX image. So you can see that the sources are standing out quite brightly. You can see a lot of this filamentary structure showing up and highlighting um, the dust, being highlighted in dust emission. All right, so the outline of my talk today is first, I will again try to motivate you to do post-processing to model dust. So again, after the blood, sweat, and tears, and hundreds of thousands of CPU hours you put into doing the numerical simulation, I will try and convince you to go one step further and then make synthetic images to directly compare with observations. Then I will talk about the physics of dust modeling um, and what things you need to consider. I will talk specifically about Monte Carlo methods and why they're really ideal for doing uh, modeling of dust and dust processes. Then I will talk about the Hyperion code, uh, which was written by Tom Robitaille. It's free, publicly available for you to use. Uh, it's really great code. And uh, finally, I'll give you a suggested project to work on this afternoon. So why model dust? Well, I'll start by looking at this beautiful all-sky survey in the infrared. And you can see that the dust here is really ubiquitous within the galaxy. Okay, it's tracing out all this large-scale structure. There's star-forming regions along here. Um, so, you know, the whole galaxy is really blanketed and permeated by this uh, dust um, uh, within the galaxy. Um, so dust has a couple of important implications for uh, modeling and under understanding our galaxy. One, dust is the dominant opacity source for non-ionizing photons. So basically, anywhere you look within the galaxy, there's dust in your line of sight. Uh, dust also locks up most of the heavy elements uh, in the galaxy, such as silicon, carbon, iron, oxygen, magnesium. All these uh, heavy elements are really locked up within these dust grains. And then finally, they really control uh, the spectral energy distribution of the emitted light. So it reprocesses a, a lot of the photons that are coming out uh, along the line of sight. So in the context of star formation, it's very important to understand how dust reprocesses the light that comes from forming stars. So here's a classical evolutionary sequence of a forming protostar. Uh, with early to late stages uh, going downwards. So at very early times, the protostar is very deeply embedded. And in fact, almost all of the radiation is being heavily reprocessed by the dust. So in fact, you can't see anything about the initial source function of the protostar. Instead, what you see is a special energy distribution that's been shifted to much lower temperatures and longer wavelengths. Now the situation gets better as uh, the gas is either accreted or expelled, and slowly the SED uh, has less processing and shifts to higher temperatures. And finally, you begin to see the actual source, uh, source function, the actual luminosity of the emitting protostar. And then you have some residual uh, post-processing, which is from the dusty disk around the protostar. So there's really a whole um, machine or a whole art in terms of trying to model and understand what we see about these forming protostars, where people are uh, taking models and then trying to fit these distributions to infer various properties about protostars and their evolution. So to be clear, um, the dust to gas ratio here um, is still low. So most of the uh, mass is in 
gas, not in dust, but in fact, um, it's one part in 100, uh, but still the dust has a very huge effect with interacting and reprocessing all of the photons that are being emitted. So there are a number of things that you can use these SEDs to try and infer about the underlying properties. So for example, you might want to pull out the dust properties themselves and how they might evolve uh, over the phase of the forming star, how they might evolve within the disk from, say, small interstellar grains to fluffier, larger grains. You would like to pull out the morphology of the gas, you know, how the gas and dust are actually distributed, and all of that's encapsulated within this uh, one-dimensional SED. You want to pull out the source properties, you know, the underlying source function, and then hopefully something about the temperature distribution. Now at high densities, um, the dust and gas are thermally coupled, so if you can learn anything about uh, the dust temperature, then you also can learn something about the gas temperature as well. All right. So now I'll move on to the physics of dust, emission, absorption, and scattering. So here is a fiducial dust grain. As you can see, it's a very complicated, blobby, porous, um, very interesting type of object. So if you've taken um, any ISM class or thought about um, how we model uh, dust grains and their interactions with photons, you'll know that the first thing we do in this process is we assume a spherical dust grain. So automatically that makes the process of understanding the physics a whole lot easier. Because now it's a sphere, so it has some effective radius A. So uh, a couple of the first things you can define are the extinction cross-section, uh, cross which is just pi A squared times Q extinction, which is based upon the underlying characteristics of the dust grain, uh, what it's made of, what its size is, its fundamental properties. Here, Q extinction is the sum of Q scattering plus Q abs, the absorption uh, coefficient. So both these things depend upon the fundamental properties of the dust. An important quantity is also uh, known as the albedo, which is the ratio of the scattering to the extinction cross-sections. So this is some number between 0 and 1 and depends upon wavelength. So for comparison, here's uh, the visual albedo of a bunch of um, things on Earth. Um, so you can see, for example, snow is very reflective. And I tend to think of this quantity as the amount of shininess uh, some object has, how much light is being reflected back versus being absorbed. In comparison, here are two uh, bodies in the solar system that actually have albedos that are close to uh, one. So they're reflecting almost all of the light that is, being, um, that is shining on them. Um, just to relate this to the opacity, which we've talked about before, um, basically the absorption opacity is simply uh, the uh, extinction cross-section per unit mass of dust. So aside from absorbing or extincting uh, photons, another thing that happens is scattering. So some photon comes along and then is redirected based upon its interaction with the dust grain. So several things can happen. You can have a forward scattering, which is basically a, a kind of diffraction when the photon is comparable in size to the dust grain. You can have uh, an isotropic interaction, so the photon is equally likely to be scattered somewhere else or it can be preferentially backscattered. So that is um, a photon interacts with the grain and is reflected right back. So these are complex functions which depend upon the fundamental grain properties and the wavelength of light doing the interaction. So this problem would be extremely annoying if you had to compute all of these things for yourself and for every problem to make up a distribution of dust grains. But luckily, someone has devoted most of their career to doing this for you. Um, so you can find a lot of information about dust, typical dust models, compositions, properties, uh, by going to Bruce Strain's website. And he's written a number of very helpful papers on specific ISM type dust, or uh, dust within the galaxy or in, in local uh, universe. And so he tabulates all of these important quantities. And it's not just one grain, but there's some distribution of sizes and properties which you can vary depending upon the environment that you want to model and study. 
So to summarize, this is really the problem of modeling dust. So you have some nice simple source function, you know, stars or protostars are practically, you know, just black bodies. And then there's this uh, pesky dust and that processes all these photons and at the end you're left with this messy, completely inscrutable type of SED at the end. And so the job of this modeling, you know, is really to try to uh, model this process and somehow make sense of this out, uh, output SED. So as you can see, this is something that may not uh, work well with a typical radiative transfer equation that we talked about before, which seems to be a very simple and linear problem. And the problem of dust is in no way simple and linear. So that brings us to Monte Carlo methods. Does anyone have any questions so far? Okay. So the idea behind the Monte Carlo method is that instead of solving some linear equation, we will instead repeatedly randomly sample from some underlying probability distribution function. Now, uh, Monte Carlo methods were actually invented in the 1940s um, by some scientists who are working on the Manhattan Project at Los Alamos. And the problem that prompted the study was they were trying to understand the propagation of neutrons in a medium and how likely they were to interact with nuclei. So they realized this is very nonlinear. And Stanislaw uh, Ulam came up with this idea that maybe it could be done probabilistically. So uh, everything at Los Alamos at that time needed a code name. And so Nicholas Metropolis came up with the idea of calling this the Monte Carlo method after the casino uh, from which uh, Ulam's uncle borrowed money. So, and that kind of makes sense because gambling, Monte Carlo, random functions, you can see how it all links together. Um, now, John von Neumann comes in here. He's one of the forefathers of modern computer science. He immediately recognized what a powerful technique this was, and he went ahead and created the first Monte Carlo computer program. So whatever giant machine they had at Los Alamos at the time, he actually programmed this algorithm into it in order to do the first Monte Carlo simulations. And this whole thing led to the uh, mathematical field of random number generation. Because you know, if you're sampling probability distribution functions, you need lots and lots of random numbers. And until that time, they kind of had some sort of lists of random numbers which are quite painful to generate. So this has really led to breakthroughs in computer science and mathematics, among other problems. So in the context of astrophysics and radiative transfer, what's going on is that the underlying probability distribution function is the source function of, of say, the protostar or the star. So you can randomly sample that to uh, create a, a set of photons to propagate through the medium. Uh, however, it's commonly referred to as photon packets. If you're doing individual photons, uh, again, that problem might take even too long, so instead you kind of bunch them up into larger packets. So one of the helpful things you can do with these packets is that you can assign some weight to them and then through each interaction with um, dust, you know, say if it's absorbed, it has some probability of being absorbed versus scattered and you can deposit weight as a uh, photon packet travels through the medium. So it's a way also of keeping track of kind of probability. So again, this allows us to not solve the radiation transfer problem directly. Instead, it becomes a propagation problem where we generate randomly a bunch of photons and then we track their path in each interaction through the medium. So for each of these uh, photons, they basically have three different things they can do. They can be scattered, uh, they can be absorbed, and then re-emitted. And so all of these things are in turn randomly sampled from some underlying uh, probability distribution function. All right, any questions about that? All right, so that brings us, mm -hmm. like yes? Mm -hmm. So you have photon packets, so I assume that's a whole bunch of photons. When you do dust, does that mean that you actually have very large dust grains? Um, 
No, no. Um, I think the point is that you can actually assign, you can do different weightings. So how do you draw the photons from the distribution function? So you can all give them like an equal weight. You can give them a kind of equal size. And it just allows you an extra dimension. You can also assign, as I said, this um, probability to them. So as they go along, you do deposit, you know, as you interact with the photon, you have some probability of interaction. You deposit uh, some weight depending upon how likely it is to be absorbed or emitted. But no, you don't, this doesn't translate into extra large grains or anything like that. Um, okay. So the, the code that I'm going to be talking about today is the Hyperion code. And it's actually really relatively new. Tom finished it and published a paper on it in 2011. Here's the website. Um, this is Tom Robitaille here. And should you have any questions uh, about this lecture, you can email Tom at this email address. And um, Tom is a very cool guy. And he actually has a Twitter uh, account. And so this is his Twitter handle, Astrofrog. And I encourage you to follow him. He also twitters about things that are not related to radiative transfer. So um, this is, you know, he's a really cool guy. So you should definitely, um, you should follow him whether or not you like the Hyperion code because there's, he's tapped into all kinds of things uh, which are going on in astrophysics. Um, all right. Uh, so as you can see, Hyperion does a whole lot of different things, which I'm going to uh, talk about uh, in the next few slides. And the main thing which uh, it does is dust continuum radiative transfer. Now, um, I will show you one other picture of Tom. This is Tom in the infrared, which I think is very appropriate for this lecture. Um, this was actually uh, taken at a Spitzer conference a few years ago, where they took pictures of everyone at the conference with an infrared camera. So um, yes, we have infrared Tom. All right. So the hardest part about doing the radio transfer problem is to set up the post-processing and inputs correctly. So the first thing that you need to specify is the source distribution and the source properties. So um, you need to know the total luminosity of the source, the source position, and the source spectrum. For the source spectrum, you have three different choices. Uh, you can make them uh, just I simple isotropic point sources, like black bodies. You can uh, assume that it's actually a resolved source. Uh, so you have a spherical source, like a star. And then you can add in this extra level of detail about limb darkening or hot and cool spots and various properties about the distribution. You can also uh, specify diffuse sources. So if you don't have point sources or stars, maybe you have shocks, and you want those shocks to contribute in the form of some kind of radiation. Uh, this might be uh, some energy dissipation, some viscous shearing, something that's injecting additional uh, luminosity onto the grid. And finally, you can also specify external isotropic sources. So supposing you have a molecular cloud that you want to model, and there happens to be a cluster of stars above that cloud, which is uh, shiny radiation onto the cloud. So in that case, you can specify that as kind of a boundary condition in the problem. So the next thing you need to specify is the dust. So you need to specify, in particular, the dust density distribution. So your simulations are probably giving you the total mass density. Um, so you need to convert that into an effective dust density. So then you need to decide, you know, what is the dust to gas ratio? You know, you'll probably pick a standard, standard value, but you can imagine in some cases where the dust to gas ratio might be different. You also need to specify the dust properties. Um, and as I said before, you're incredibly lucky because uh, there's been a whole lot of work on this. And so you can adopt some of these standard uh, dust um, property uh, input files. You might also want to specify dust sublimation. For example, a very near your source, the dust might be destroyed. So you need to specify some kind of mechanism for that to happen. And there are a couple of different options for doing that. You also need to specify these mean, um, actually, you don't need to specify the mean opacities and emissivities. They are actually taken from your dust properties. And Hyperion pre-computes 
the average values to use within the calculation. And it does so assuming LTE, which we talked about yesterday. So Hyperion um, is pretty general. Tom is working to make it even more general. So in terms of the underlying density distributions, you can pick from a, several different setups. Um, you can put in a 3D Cartesian grid, a spherical grid, cylindrical grid, or even some kind of adaptive grid. So right now, Hyperion works with both octree type AMR grids and a kind of block structured AMR grids. So Hyperion, for example, will directly read in uh, Orion data. So it's very efficient. And if you're interested in actually adding more functionality, you uh, can probably talk to Tom about it, whether he's either currently developing it or be really interested in collaborating with you to add that as new uh, capability. All right, so how does the radiative transfer actually happen in Hyperion? Okay, so I'll just go through a very simple schematic for what happens. So you put in some input source with some total bolometric luminosity and some spectrum. Okay, in step one, you have your spectral distribution and a photon packet is drawn randomly from this distribution with some direction and some frequency. Next, this photon packet is assigned an optical depth. And this optical depth is again randomly drawn from the distribution E to the minus tau. Okay, so it's some smallish optical depth. Then this photon packet is propagated a distance uh, with an optical depth tau along the random path that was chosen. At this point, then uh, Hyperion checks, has this photon escaped the domain or is it still on the domain? Okay, so if um, the domain is reached before the full optical depth, then the photon escapes and we're done. But if it doesn't, then it interacts. So how does it interact? Again, we draw another random number. This one is uh, C between 0 and 1. And then C is compared to the albedo of the local dust, okay? And that depends upon the wavelength of the photon. So if C is greater than the albedo, then the photon will be absorbed. If it's less, then the photon will be scattered. So then the process begins again. So once we have our uh, new photon, we draw a new optical depth, and then we go through this again. So each time at each step, randomly drawing from these underlying distributions and comparing to the local dust properties. Now you can imagine that this could be a problem. If you have a very high optical depth, then what happens is your photon will just keep bouncing around and bouncing around and it will never actually escape from the domain. So this can make the problem very time intensive. So Hyperion has a couple of different options for cases with high optical depth. And basically the essence is it switches to a diffusion approximation. So you then can go back to this simple radiative transfer calculation and do the problem rather than doing Monte Carlo. All right. So besides the photon propagation, one thing you want to get out of this calculation is the distribution of dust temperatures. So this is obtained using an iterative method, okay? So in the first iteration, Hyperion computes the specific energy absorption rate of the dust, so at a particular point. And this energy absorption rate depends upon the local photons. So it depends upon uh, this delta T, the time of the photon is emitted, the volume of the cell, E, which is the um, energy of the photon packet, and then the summation over the path length times the mass absorption coefficient. So once you have calculated A at a point in the grid, then you can go ahead and compute the temperature assuming LTE. So in LTE, the source function is just the Planck function, and then you can uh, pull out a temperature T. But um, then this is really a, a problem because this temperature T uh, and the source function depends on what the photons were doing. So then you can see you have to loop back around until you converge to a fixed temperature because the source function, the emissivities, and A all depend upon the photons. So uh, in this case, you would need to specify 
the number of iterations to convergence, so how many iterations you do in each step, or you can more helpfully specify at which point you give up in the iterative process. So a handy way to specify this is you can say the temperatures are converged when 99.9% .9 of the cells um, have an absorption rate difference by less than a factor of two. So you could also try to make this all the cells, but then if you have some particular problem cell that's not converging, it can hold up the entire calculation. So in this case, I think Tom uh, recommends uh, using this 99.9% .9 calculation. And this is, you know, this is something that when you're setting up a problem, you probably want to play around with the number of iterations in your convergence criterion to make sure that the answers you get out are not too sensitive to this. All right. So once you know about the photon propagation, once you know about the temperatures, uh, the thing you really want to know is what the output SED is and what is the output image. What does this thing look like based upon the propagation of the uh, radiation? So there are several different options for computing SEDs and images. The first is the simplest, which is photon binning. So in this case, you basically sit outside the problem domain and then you bin the photons as they come out in different viewing angles. So this is really simple, but there's a problem that um, you have a finite viewing, you must have a finite viewing angle bin, and if you don't have very many photons, you can end up with really crappy images. So one solution to this is to switch and do a peeling off method. So in this case, uh, it's basically more efficient because you get to count every photon multiple times. So what you do is that after each scattering or readmission, so after each interaction with the dust, you, you have some probability P of that photon being scattered into your line of sight, into that viewing angle you're interested in. Then you can add up these probabilities for that viewing angle for all of the scattering interactions. And from that, you can get an integrated SCD or image. So this is uh, efficient because you get to uh, add up these probabilities and it has a much better signal to noise. The final option is through ray tracing. So this isn't, uh, you can't use this for understanding the scattering, but you can for the thermal emission. So the ray tracing is again going back to solving the radio transfer equation along the line of sight based upon these uh, uh, temperatures that we computed in the previous step. So as I said, this currently only works for thermal emission and at long wavelengths. Um, Tom hopes to implement this for scattering in the future, um, but it's still useful because to get a really nice image, you can combine both of these two things. You can have ray tracing to get really good clear thermal em um, emission at longer wavelengths and combine this with the peeling off to get the correct result for the scattering. Yes? Um, no. So this is happening, I think, within the propagation. So for each interaction, you keep track of, you know, what is the probability of scattering into a particular viewing angle? So when you're doing the setup of the problem, you would tell Hyperion which viewing angles you're interested in. And so you can keep track of the photon probabilities as you're doing the propagation. Does that make sense? Yes, but if the photon you see in the cloud, you don't scatter the viewing angle, but you necessarily see it or not. Yeah, so I think what you're asking is related to the double counting. So, you're, okay, so you still track the photons of whether they escape the cloud, but this whole thing is probabilistic. So at any given interaction, they could scatter into your line of sight by some probability. And that's what you're keeping track of. You don't stop, um, you don't stop calculating the random trajectory of our actual photon packet, which is kind of a representative photon. Does that make sense? OK. But another question, mm -hmm. so isn't the second method exact? I'm just wondering why you need the third method. Um, I think the reason is, is that so scattering, um, can, okay, so scattering can occur preferentially in certain directions, in certain viewing angles. And so if you just do that, then you may not have very high photon sampling in other viewing angles. 
And that doesn't mean there's no omission there, but it's just not very good sampling, even with the probabilities. So I think that the thermal emission um, also helps you compute uh, better image quality. Uh, I, think it would be, I think it'd be difficult to try to mesh them together. That is, if it's very thermal, then I can see why at the bottom it works. But when you start making the transition, uh, then the, the second method seems to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. So I don't know how these two are combined to get the final image. Um, We'll see that we're specifying both, but I think, um, and it doesn't, I don't recall in the documentation how these images are combined, but that's something that's probably worth following up on. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay. All right. <clears throat> so, happily, Hyperion is parallelized. Uh, unlike RADMC 3D yesterday, which uh, only worked in serial, um, Hyperion is. Uh, paralyzed via MPI, and it uh, does so very efficiently. Um, part of it is the inherent nature of the problem, as Monte Carlo methods are inherently embarrassingly parallel. So the step at which the protons are, uh, the photons are, are propagated, that part scales almost perfectly. So here's an example problem showing the speed up of the problem as a function of the number of cores. So you can see that it initially scales completely perfectly along this line, and then there's some turnover where it limits to some uh, value. So what's going on here is even though it scales perfectly, there's still these initial and final steps that has to happen in serial. So the I.O., the you know, problem set up at the beginning, the you know, breaking the problem up into the different processors, and then finally collecting the data and writing it out. That part can't be speeded up. So you have all of the points here, and then there's a best fit line, which is the theoretical prediction, um, which is a fit to the parallel part and the serial part. Okay. So basically, it's speeding up uh, as best it, as it possibly can. So it's almost an ideal speed up. Yes? Um, Yes, I can't remember how many photons per core. Yeah, it's in the paper, I'm sure. Um, yeah, so definitely, you know, if you care about the speed up and running a large number of uh, processors, uh, you can do that, but you're probably going to uh, max out at around 200 to 500 processors. So uh, in the paper, Tom presented a number of test problems to show how well Hyperion does relative to other uh, benchmark problems and relative to other codes. So here's a 2D disk benchmark problem, basically just has a source uh, with some uh, luminosity, which is the dashed line, and then some surrounding disk. And this is looking through that in two different uh, viewing angles for different disk masses. And the reason why this problem is, uh, is done is to make sure that the radio transfer works well in both very optically thin and very optically thick limits. So here, Hyperion in black is compared with the code radical, uh, which are these circles. And radical is actually uh, written by Keyes Dulemond, uh, who also wrote RADMC3D. And uh, this approach is not actually a Monte Carlo method. It's a short characteristics plus uh, variable Eddington tensor approach. So it's a completely different method of computing the radio transfer. Um, and of course, you guys all remember about those approaches from last week. <coughs> all right. Um, so you can see the differences relative to the two codes. Um, and it, it actually does pretty well um, with pretty low errors. And these other gray lines are actually other approaches that have been compared. And Hyperion's results kind of within the scatter of the other approaches. So it does pretty well. So the next problem uh, is a 3D disk benchmark problem. This is presented originally in Pinti et al. 2009 and compared against four other different radio transfer methods. So this is an even more stringent problem because it has optical depths going up to 10 to the 6. And it also tests um, anisotrop, it tests scattering and (laughs) polarization. All right. So here you can see the images which are being compared. 
And you can see there's more uh, radiation coming out on the top than on the bottom. And Hyperion is again shown in black. This is kind of an average. And uh, the different code results averaged together are shown in gray. So it's a bit noisy there. I'm not entirely sure why the other results are so much more noisy compared to Hyperion. Um, but you can see they both follow along the same uh, trajectories. And they both, um, and they're doing really well even at these very high optical depths. All right. Finally, um, my favorite part of the presentation paper, uh, Tom borrowed one of my simulations, which I showed you on the first slide, and made synthetic images uh, in different bands. So we have Spitzer IRAC, JHK, uh, the Herschel Pax, and Herschel Spire. And you can really see the different cloud structure and the, and the difference in the source luminosities is appearing in different wavelengths. Um, in the second step, what he did was he added a synthetic noise, uh, as would be expected for these different observations, uh, the exact pixel resolution, and the PSFs for the different beams for these different instruments. So, you know, if this cloud was a couple hundred parsecs away and observed by these instruments, this is what it would look like. Now, what you can see is that a lot of the clarity, a lot of the sharpness that was apparent over here is now lost. So you have some degradation as a result of the inherent limitations of the observations. In particular, you can see that the Herschel spire has become quite uh, blurry. Um, and a lot of the Herschel stuff is has lost some of the high contrast. Um, it still looks pretty good over here in JHK, though. Uh, what's the acronym PSF stand for? Uh, PAX. Um, does anyone remember what PAX stands for? PSF. Oh, PSF. Oh, that's the, um, let's basically, what is P? Point like point, spread point spread function. function. Thank you, yes. Yes, a fancy word for the, the way the beam looks. Yeah. Uh, okay. So in terms of setting up the problem, here's a, the schematic of uh, what you would follow. The Hyperion radio transfer module is pretty self-contained. So as before, um, I've already installed and compiled it for you. So unless you do not like uh, some of the Hyperion functionality and you want to change it, you will not need to recompile Hyperion with every problem. So instead, what you would spend most of your effort on is creating the HDF5 input file. And this specifies all of the inputs, all of the parameters, all of the problems set up that Hyperion needs to do um, the radio transfer. So the example file uh, is made in uh, Python. So this is basically a script that produces the HDF file. So you will find that in the tutorial um, problem directory. But again, you can use whatever code you like, your favorite code, um, Java scheme, it doesn't matter, um, as long as you end up with an HDF5 file with the appropriate file format. So afterwards, uh, Hyperion outputs a file uh, model RT out, which is also an HDF5 file. And again, you can uh, do whatever analysis and post-processing you like to plot and analyze that data. Um, one uh, nice thing is that Tom is putting in a direct output to YT so that you'll be able to read in and analyze this file with YT. So he was going to do that uh, sometime this week, um, so you should be on the lookout for that if you're interested. All right, so now we have round two of the people who stare at code. Um, so this might be slightly less painful than yesterday because now it's in Python and not in IDL. Um, so this is basically setup.py. Um, so basically you make a, a Hyperion model M and then you uh, assign particular parameters uh, to the model, uh, including you know, what type of grid it is, what is the uh, size of the grid spacing, what is the density distribution, and what is the particular dust model that you're going to be using in the calculation. Then you likewise would set up your sources. So add however many sources you like, uh, assign them uh, the various luminosities and temperatures um, for their source functions. 
And then you would assign the different types of output you want Hyperion to create. So if you want SEDs, um, you would create uh, images and specify the, uh, the number of SEDs, the uh, range of wavelengths, and the different viewing angles at which you want to see those SEDs. Likewise, if you want uh, multi-wavelength images, uh, so you want a full image of the problem, again, you specify the wavelength range, uh, the different viewing angles, the number of images, and the image size. Um, it also has a handy capability that you can uh, kind of make uh, images that will be good for making a movie in that you can make a kind of um, a set of images from a range of different uh, viewing angles uh, repeated at a very fine increment of, of viewing angle so that when you get the output you can then ma uh, make this into a, a movie or you can look at all sides. So finally you need to set the runtime parameters. So what is the particular parameters? What type of ray tracing or number of photons do you need? So if you care about the temperature, then you need to set the number of iterations to converge on the temperature. Um, if you, um, in the most basic default version, you're doing the Monte Carlo, so you need the number of uh, photons to compute the specific energy. And Tom gives a particular rule of thumb, which is in the optically thin limit, if your problem is very optically thin, then the number of photon packets is approximately equal to the number of cells on, uh, within the domain of your problem. But if it's optically thick, then you're likely to need 10 times or 100 times as many photons as you have cells. Um, this imaging specifies the number of photons that will, uh, you'll need to construct your image. If you have ray tracing, then I guess you need two other uh, photon uh, numbers for ray tracing sources and ray tracing dust. And then finally, um, you specify the name of the file that's going to be written out at the end. So running this is quite simple. Uh, assuming you're using Python and this is your setup file, then you just need to run the setup.py. Then you can call Hyperion with the name of the input file and the name of the output file. Or um, this is in serial, or you can run it in parallel and you specify the number of uh, processors that you're going to use. And this should be the correct syntax uh, for the cluster here. Um, so to view outputs, uh, the YT part isn't quite done yet. Um, so you can either use HDF view or you can uh, change your HDF5 output to a FITS file and uh, use IDL or DS9 or whatever your favorite program is. And um, so out of curiosity, how many people here use FITS files? That's what I thought. See, I never used FITS files myself until I started working with observers. And now that's almost the default output file that I use. So if, you know, never mind. FITS files are not particularly helpful. Just stick with the HDF5. Okay, so finally the suggested project. All right, so what I've done is I've set up a high pack problem directory in the source code. And I've given you a, a FITS file, sorry guys, of the density distribution with a one L-Sun protostellar source at the center. So we'll use, um, the idea is to use Hyperion to compute an image of the emission at several different wavelengths. You can pick whichever ones for different viewing angles. And then also extract the 3D dust temperature distribution. So I wasn't sure what kind of inputs you guys would have uh, as a fun as, uh, throughout this workshop. So I was a little bit worried you might not have anything that had sources in it or anything that had a nice uh, uh, profile that would generate a lot of structure, so I'm giving you this example file. You can use whatever you want. If you have something already, anything that's disky with, that you can put a source in, uh, a cloud that has some sources, those are totally fine to use. Um, so you can use those instead, but here's just an example file. And the exercise that I want you to do is to run Hyperion and try to see how many photons you need to put in to have a converged SED or image. Okay, and make sure also how many photons you need to have a converged dust uh, temperature distribution. 
So this is a really important exercise for you to do if you're running this to get particular outputs to compare with observations. You want to make sure that you have good signal to noise and your temperatures are converged and not changing as a function of these initial parameters. So the source code um, is just in my home directory. Uh, it's in home slash softener slash Hyperion 0.9.1. And the project stuff um, and the tutorial stuff is in this particular path. Okay. So Tom has some really nice documentation online, which is really useful for understanding the code and doing the setup. Um, I don't actually find that he has many example problems. Um, there is one that I've used here in the tutorials, but other than that, um, there, there really aren't many examples for you to run. So I would encourage you to try to modify this and do an example setup for yourself. Um, so in this directory, we have the fits density file and the HDF5 dust file, which is actually this one from Weingartner and Drain 2001 with a uh, reddening of 5.5. So just as an example of what you can do, if you take this FITS file, you run Hyperion on it, you generate the gas temperature distribution, which is shown in red, and you feed the density and temperature into YT, then you can make a lovely movie, and this is what you should see. Okay? So this is, corresponds to the particular FITS file I gave you as an example. All right, I'll conclude with some useful references. Uh, an early version of Tom's code was written in 2D by Barbara Whitney, so if you want some early papers on an early astrophysical example of Monte Carlo code, you can check these papers out. Uh, there's Tom's recent paper. Uh, this Weingartner and Drain 2001 paper is a really standard paper on ISM dust properties and is commonly used. This particular distribution is very commonly used. And then these Drain 2003 papers are kind of an update on that, and a lot of those uh, properties have been used by Tom in these dust files that come along with Hyperion, so those are worth reading. And in general, basically, in the, in the context of the subject and on dust, probably anything by Bruce Drain is worth reading. So, you know, anything's good. And then finally, if you have any questions or require help, you should email help at hyperionrt.org. All right, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.